All right, I hope everybody had a good Thanksgiving this week uh, with family. And uh, of course, as always, you know, we, we have such a good time uh, getting caught up with folks we hadn't seen for a while, you know, and seeing what's going on in their lives. It was good to have my daughter and son-in-law in from North Carolina from seminary. And uh, unfortunately, uh, they were going to be here today, but she's running that 100 degree plus fever, so not able to come. But, it, but I hope you had a good week. And uh, in light of Thanksgiving, and we didn't get to do this last week because of our lessons pushing, pushing past with the uh, I want us to kind of revisit one story that happened 400 years ago this year. 400 years ago. In fact, Eric Metaxas, gifted writer, he's the guy that wrote Amazing Grace. Remember the William Wilber Wilberforce story? Um, then he wrote Bonhoeffer. Uh, about Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the German pastor who was uh, martyred uh, for his faith uh, during the Nazi regime. And then he most recently wrote Luther, which uh, you know I've shared with you uh, from some of that a couple of years ago. And he's written a bunch of other books too, but just a gifted writer. And he, and he says this to kind of kick this off, every once in a great while the hand of God is easy to see, and for a brief moment fairy tales and history are the same thing. This story is about one of those times. So just go back with me and think. Uh, go back to 400 years ago and um, remember with me, if you would, um, 1619. That year, um, pretty eventful in the life of a young man. He's 20-some years old, early 20s. Uh, by this point, maybe closer to 30, I guess, by, by this point. Um, he's, uh, he's in his village. He's been away for years and has not seen his family. And he comes back and he searches um, in his old village and there's nobody there. Everybody's gone. I mean, nobody, no living soul is there. And so he kind of wanders around and he, he looks, at, you know, everything's broken down. All the, you know, structures, wigwams, whatever you want to call them. He's obviously a Native American. Um, everything's broken down. There's, there's only, you know, broken pottery, human bones strewn about. Nobody. Now, according to tradition, he was married, no wife there, had family, no family there, not a living soul in the village that this man grew up in. And we know him, of course, as Squanto, tis quantum, as exactly sure what that means. Um, some Native Americans have given it a, given it a meaning. <laughs> Uh, the wrath, wrath of the Manitou, or something like that. But uh, tis quantum. If you look at uh, at the Latin, um, quantum is like how much, how much more, or as much as, or something like that. Uh, but we don't know what the tis means in front of it. So anyway, we really don't know what his name means. But we do know that he came to his village 400 years ago, and he found that everybody was dead. His whole family. And much of his life, of course, is a mystery. We don't have a lot to go on when we're talking about this guy. Um, but he was born about 1585 near Plymouth, Massachusetts. I don't know if you've ever been there and seen Plymouth Plantation, the new version of it, right, that's nearby. Um, obviously, where it is now is not exactly where they were, but um, it's a good representation. And this man was a Patuxent Indian, and he was associated with the Wampanoag tribe that, that you know from your Thanksgiving stories, I guess. But he was captured multiple times <laughs> and enslaved by uh, English uh, sea captains primarily. So Captain George Weymouth was the first uh, to capture him, lured him on board on the promise of some trade. And Weymouth was uh, one of the guys trying to find a north pa northwest passage to India and to China. Of course, he was unsuccessful in that mission. 
But the reason for that mission is what we talked about when we talked about Columbus, remember? And the Ottoman Turks had taken over Constantinople. You couldn't get, couldn't go that way, so you had to try to find another way. And that's what, uh, of course, Columbus and many others were trying to do. So Weymouth was trying to do that, and in the process, um, all these voyages started. And they started visiting the northeast of what, you know, in our country, New England now, by the 1520s. And in his ship, the Archangel, he was exploring the coast of Maine and Massachusetts, bankrolled by this Fernando Gorges, uh, now we call him Georges, but there's even a historical marker for some of his discoveries, this Weymouth. And in uh, the book that Gorges wrote, he mentions this Tisquantum character, this Squanto, and um, tells about the first time that he was captured. So Weymouth couldn't find the Northwest Passage, but he happened, happened on a river in the coast of America called the Pemaquid, from which he sought uh, he brought uh, five natives, uh, three of which uh, had names that uh, he lists here. One of those is Tisquantum, Squanto. And I thought it was interesting that Gorges added this little comment. This accident must be acknowledged the means under God of putting on foot and giving life to all our plantations. He wrote this in 1658, had the benefit of looking back on this event and seeing the providence of God in the capture of Squanto and the way God used him. And we're going to look, we're going to see that here in just a minute. But I thought that was, was an interesting uh, guy gave. Now, as to how he was captured, um, here's how it went down, according to one of the guys in his journal. About 8 o'clock, uh, we went on shore with our boats. When I came back to the ship, there were two canoes, and either of them three savages, one of them was Squanto, and of whom two were below at the fire, and the other stated, uh, stated in their canoes about the ship. And because we couldn't entice them aboard, we gave them a can of peas and bread, and they carried to the shore to eat. But one of them brought back our can presently and stayed aboard with the other two, for he being young, of a ready capacity, and one we most desired to bring with us into England, had received exceeding kind usage at our hands and was therefore much delighted in our company. And when our captain, this is Weymouth, was come, uh, we consulted how to catch the other three at the shore, which we performed thus, opened the box, the hold of the ship, right? Showed them trifles to exchange. Uh, he, <laughs> he had some baubles to show them, but he's got the hold of the ship ready to go and thinking therefore, uh, thereby to banish fear from the other and draw him to return. But when we couldn't, we used a little delay, but suddenly laid hands on him. That sounds King James, right? <laughs> and it was as much as five or six of us to get, do to get them into the light horsemen, for they were strong and so naked as our best hold was by their long hair on their head. So we got them by the hair of the head and would have been very low to have done them any hurt, which of necessity would have been constrained to have done if we had attempted them in a multitude. If it had a bunch of them, there would have been no way, which we must and would, rather than have wanted them being a matter of great importance for the full accomplishment of our voyage. Thus, we shipped five savages and two canoes and all their bows and arrows. So, they brought them back to England, and Weymouth introduced them to none other than William Shakespeare. So Squanto got a chance to meet William Shakespeare. What a deal, huh? Um, and the Earl of Southampton, who of course was bankrolling both Shakespeare and his plays and the voyages that were going on. So the first time he got captured, 1605, he gets to go to England and meets William Shakespeare. Although as a captive, probably not happy about that. Who the heck is Shakespeare anyway? I don't care. I just want to go home. But from our perspective, it was a, a big deal, right? So he got a chance to meet, meet uh, Shakespeare. And he and these two other natives went to live in Plymouth. Remember, that's what they end up calling the colony, right? Uh, with an investor, Sir Fernando Gorges, who helped fund the expedition to settle uh, Maine. And Squanto and the others were in England for nine years, from 1605 to 1614. So you think they learned anything while they were there? I would think they probably did. I mean, they could only speak their native tongue with the three that were there, 
with gorges, so they had to learn English, right? They had to learn English, they learned English ways, culture, probably religion too, um, I would think, because it was very, a very religious time um, in England at that point. The Reformation was just really uh, taking off and running and going. Um, you, you had the, you know, the King James Version published in 1611, so faith was a big deal. Uh, back then. So they, they had to learn some English stuff, right? At least English language, if not a lot of other things. So he was there for nine years before he got a chance to come back to America. So he joined this mapping expedition uh, for the coast of New England as the interpreter. Very valuable guy now because he's bilingual. He can speak his own tribe plus other tribe language, but at least bilingual. <laughs> and can speak English. So he's the perfect guy, right? I mean, he's in demand. Uh, so he comes back and he comes, uh, comes back and he, he uh, is able to return to his tribe and to his family. Remember, this is before 1619. It's five years before that all goes down. And so he's, he gets a chance to come back. But he's captured again <laughs> near his home, this time by Thomas Hunt who's working for Captain John Smith. And you remember John Smith from Jamestown fame. And we talked all about John Smith, the dude that had his head put on the rock, about to get his brains beaten out when Pocahontas put her head on his head. You know all about him, right? Well, Captain John Smith was not responsible for Squanto's capture. He was there to map and to fish, but Hunt says, I'm going to stay back a little longer. And he didn't have in mind fish or fur to trade. He was looking for human cargo. And so sure enough, Thomas Hunt lured Squanto and 23 others from not only the Patuxet tribe, but also the Nauset tribe, warlike people aboard the ship with the promise of trade, some of the baubles and stuff. And yes, they clapped him in irons and put him in the hold of the ship. And Hunt sailed from Malaga, Spain. <laughs> which was notorious for slave trade during its Muslim occupation. So Muslim slave traders were just ready for slaves to ship down into Africa to serve other Muslims down there, right? Um, so that's where Hunt headed. But in the providence of God, and this is, a, this is according to... Uh, you know, our friend Eric Metaxas, he wrote a little book on Squanto. But what we read from Bradford is essentially that there were some Catholic friars. We, we got a few scant sources that tell us there were some ca Catholic friars who took pity on him and the other natives who were about to be auctioned to these Muslim slave traders. And they, were, uh, they either bought him or talked Hunt out of doing it. We're not exactly sure, but here's what Gorges wrote in, his, in, a, in another book, that Captain Thomas Hunt was able to sell a few natives, but when the friars of those parts discovered his unscrupulous activity, they took the rest of the natives to be, quote, instructed in the Christian faith and so disappoint, disappointed his unworthy, this unworthy fellow Hunt in his hopes of gain. So, if he didn't learn the Christian faith in nine years in England, which I'm sure he did, he at least learned it with these Catholic friars, these Franciscan monks, who apparently took him to a monastery. Now, I'm going to read you from, from uh, Eric Metaxas. I think this is more sanctified uh, imagination than it is history, but here's what he says happened as the way that this thing went down. He said, uh, the one day the ship dropped, uh, then one day the ship dropped anchor, this is in Malaga, at long last they'd come to land, the hatch was opened and Squanto and his fellow captives were brought ashore. The glaring sun burned their eyes, the air was dry and hot, I guess it is in Malaga, Spain, and everything was dusty from a great heat. Uh, Squanto didn't know it yet, but he was now in the country of Spain in the city called Malaga. And one of the men from the ship roughly herded Squanto and the other braves toward a crowd of people in the dock. And one by one, the braves were forced to stand before the jeering crowd. They were being sold as slaves. Squanto watched his companions as each one was sold and taken away forever. But God had another plan for Squanto. On the deck that morning stood a group of men who were different from the others. These men were called monks, and they served God. And when it was Squanto's turn to be sold, 
one of the monks held a small bag of heavy coins, and the man from the ship snatched the coins and shoved Squanto toward the monks. And so the monks led Squanto to the monastery where they lived, and they spoke kindly words that he didn't understand. But they fed him, gave him a comfortable place to sleep, helped him understand that they meant him no harm. And as time passed, the monks taught Squanto their language. Now, what would Catholic monks speak? Latin. 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 And where, what, what is his name again? His real name? Tisquantum. It's a Latin name. So I think these guys are the ones that end up naming him. Naming him. Um, this name, and we're not sure exactly what it means, but it says that they explained that the God they worship saw everything that had happened. He knows the future as well as the past, and God loves you, they said, and he's seen all you've been through, and if you'll trust him, he'll use those difficulties in ways that you could never imagine. So that's what Metaxas and his sanctified imagination adds to this thing. I can only give you the history and I can share with you the sanctified imagination of Eric Metaxas, but we don't know exactly what happened with Squanto. We do know that he lived. We do know that he had a bunch of journeys back and forth. We do know that he was a captive and a slave. We do know he had some contact with some Catholic friars, at least from what we, what we read in the sources. Uh, and we know that he apparently went from Malaga, Spain, back to England because he ended up getting hired uh, again as a, as a translator uh, by John Slaney. He was a treasurer for the Newfoundland Company. He came over to Newfoundland, which is where, not America, but Canada, uh, in 1618. And he worked for the governor, uh, John Mason, um, and then he went back to England in 1619. I mean, this dude is going back and forth like a ping pong ball, <laughs> you know? You, you, you think in, in that day that, that travel wasn't very frequent, but apparently it was uh, with these fishing expeditions. So he gets a chance to then work for um, this gorgeous guy again. Uh, some people think he was captured when he was in, in Newfoundland by the you know, Gorges' men, uh, Captain Thomas Dermer, and then they brought him back to America in late 1619, thus 400 years ago. That's when he came back to find his village had been decimated. Yes? So when he gets, how does he get, does he just escape to get back? Uh, oh, from the friars, the Catholic friars? No, the they turned him loose. This, uh, they said thought he was captured again. Does he just keep escaping in order to get captured again? Or Well, the, he went willingly from the friars to England and then in England, he hooked up with this dude uh, named Slaney, uh, who hired him to go back over here, but to, to Newfoundland, Canada. This next one. But, but when, yeah, but when he's in Newfoundland, that's when Captain Thomas Dermer, who's working for Gorges, finds out that he's there. He's like, well, dude, how did that happen? You know, we had him in our employ. We want him back. So did he escape the very first time? So the, the first time um, when they, they brought him back, they just they let him go on liberty, yeah. And then he was captured by Thomas Hunt, a different sea captain. So, I mean, this guy is going back and forth. It's crazy. But Gorgeous saw his worth, so they grabbed him again. <laughs> they nabbed him a second time. And so they brought him back to America in 1619, and that's when he finds the boneyard that used to be his village. And what we have heard from that is that apparently a French ship uh, wrecked offshore Cape Cod. They came ashore and they had some kind of wicked hepatitis that they passed to all the Indians and, the, and it just wiped them out. They had no resistance to it at all. And it just, as one guy said, it was like lighting a, a chain of firecrackers. It just blew up all up the New England coast through the Indian tribes. But especially his tribe wiped them out. Now, Bradford doesn't corroborate all, I mean, he doesn't say all the stuff about the friars and everything, but he does corroborate the bookends of the story. Here's what he says in, in a Plymouth Plantation. He, Squano, was a native of this place and scarce left any, any alive beside himself. I think his brother did survive. He was carried away with diverse others by one Hunt, 
master of a ship who thought to sell them for slaves in Spain. That's corroborated. But he got away for England, and he was entertained by a merchant in London, employed to Newfoundland and other parts, and lastly brought to these parts by Captain Dermer, a gentleman employed by Sir Fernando Gorges and others for the discovery and designs in these parts. So you've got some corroboration, little pieces and bits that come together from different people to construct a story about this guy who literally is used of God to help save the Plymouth Plantation and give it a start that we all now know that began what is Massachusetts colony and really the beginnings of America, right? So this is a critical guy. He's as important as uh, Pocahontas is in Jamestown to the saving of God's people who were trying to plant a colony in Plymouth. So here's his journeys. Check him out. Ping pong man. <laughs> He's going back and forth and back and forth uh, all these various times. It's crazy uh, the journeys that this guy made. So uh, you can see there uh, how he's, he's just back and forth all over the place. But here's the, the journal um, as to how this went down with the, the sickness that uh, we talked about. We passed the coast where we found some ancient plantations, not long since populous, now utterly void. In other places, remnant remains, but not free of sickness. Their disease, the plague, for which we might perceive sores of some that escaped, we, des uh, we described the spots of such as usually die, and when we arrived at my savages, Squanto's native country, we found all dead. So everybody was wiped out. But as tragic as him being nabbed again was, think about God's providence in all that. He was preserved from dying in the plague so that he could come and help the pilgrims survive. God's providence on display right there. Um, and, you know, there's a, there's a, a book talking about, uh, you know, from colonial times all the way up to about the Civil War and talking about uh, particularly Native Americans and, and how all this went down with Dermer. And I won't go through all of that except for the fact to say that uh, Squanto kept him alive for a while, but he was eventually attacked by Epinal. Epinal was one of these Nossets. The Nossets weren't like Squanto. Squanto converted to Christianity and had grace and mercy toward people, these English, who had, you know, captured him. But the Nossets, they didn't convert to Christianity. All they wanted to do was kill them. All of them. So when the pilgrims came here, guess who was shooting arrows at them? It wasn't Squanto. It was these Nossets, because they remembered what they did <laughs> to their tribe. So that's what's going on in, in that slide right there. Now, when Squanto comes back in 1619, he's wandering the boneyard, right? Um, he ends up getting turned over to Massasoit, Massasoit of Thanksgiving fame. He's the guy that comes with all the braves to eat the feast, okay? Well, guess what Massasoit does to Squanto? You got it. Took him prisoner. <laughs> I mean, this poor guy can't win, right? Uh, but, you know, here he is. He's under suspicion, uh, according to, uh, you know, um, the sources here, because of he, all the time he'd spent with the English. Uh, and, and we don't know what was going on with this, but all we know is that he, um, he got captured by Massasoit, or traded to Massasoit, and he was a prisoner with the Wampanoag tribe. Now, meanwhile, what's going on? All this is happening over this poor Squanto character, right? Who in 1619 comes back, finds a boneyard that used to be his village. Now he's a captive, a prisoner in a neighboring tribe with Massasoit, but a continent away, God's doing something else, right? And we all know what that is. Here's the remains of Scrooby Manor. That's where the Pilgrim Church was meeting. Remember, there were two kinds of people in England. Uh, if you weren't a part of the Church of England, and happy with its successes, there were two groups that were having trouble. One group was the group that separated. And one group was the group that were the Puritans who said, we're going to hang in here and try to purify this thing from within. Well, the separatists, some of them, were called pilgrims. They began to meet about 1602 in that building that you're looking at right now. 
And the guy that was their host ended up being the mission pastor of the pilgrims in the New World. His name was Elder William Brewster. His wife, he and his wife Mary hosted the church in the livery stable underneath it in hiding so that the king's men, King James's men, could not find them because they were hunted. In fact, uh, William Brewster and his wife Mary took in a 15-year-old orphan into their home, made him their own son. His name, William Bradford. Mm -hmm. And in 1603, a year later, there was a pretty important individual who came by to visit at Scrooby Manor stepped out of a gilded carriage and he was about to be proclaimed not only the King of Scotland but the King of England, King James. And King James would prove to be their nemesis. He said to the pilgrims and all these separatists, either you conform to the Church of England or I will run you out. I will harry them out of the land. And so they said, okay, well, <laughs> you don't want us here. We don't want to be here. Well, it wasn't easy to leave, though. I mean, they tried. They wanted out. Did every time they hired a ship to go from England to Holland, his men would get the word. His spies were everywhere. His men would get the word. He would catch them as they were trying to load on the ships. One time, the men got on the ship, and the king's men came in and swooped down on the women and the kids. And you know what he did? Oh, y'all have a nice day. No, not exactly. He threw the women and the kids in jail. And while they languished in jail, it was a public spectacle. And public opinion turned against King James. And so he ended up having to let them go. But in the meantime, it took every dime and dollar, well, not dollar, but pound, I guess, uh, that the pilgrims had scraped together to go live in Holland so they had to keep delaying things but finally they make it to Holland 1608 they get out of the clutches of King James where they could practice their faith and freedom but the problem was that it they didn't they were really educated people they could read Greek and Hebrew I mean they were really smart people they read the Bible so they understood it real well and they understood that the Church of England wasn't following the Word of God but they were university types, and they weren't used to back-breaking work, which is what they found in Holland. I mean, they were getting old fast. Their kids were being sucked into the culture that is Holland, and even now it's liberal over there. I mean, you think about Amsterdam? Need I say more? <laughs> it was that way back with that then. It was more liberal, all right? So Pastor Robinson, John Robinson, said, we got to get out of here. And so they began praying about planting a colony in the New World and relocating the church. At that time, they were up to 300 people, which was a mega church in that day. But 55 of them said, we'll go on the first wave. Pastor John said, I'm going to come after you guys. Never did get to, died before he could. But they uh, started calling themselves about this time pilgrims, straight out of God's Word. Hebrews 11.13. They embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. That's how they saw themselves. Um, with all the difficulties that they'd been through, they, they believed that they were pilgrims. Um, and William Bradford said, part of the reason why they came, lastly, and which is not the least, a great hope and inward zeal that they had of laying some good foundation or at least make some way there and to. Why'd they want to go here? Why do we want to come here? Spread the gospel. Advance the kingdom, right? Even though we might be stepping stones, we may never make it happen, but we at least want to lay our lives down so that some others can come and share the gospel here and make this a part of the kingdom of God in America. Pretty cool uh, as far as the motivation goes. And he said, as the people of God in old time were called out of Babylon civil, the place of their bodily bondage, and we're come to Jerusalem and there to build the Lord's temple. So we are people of God now to go out of Babylon spiritual to Jerusalem, a new Jerusalem here in America, and build themselves as lively stones into a spiritual house 
uh, or temple for the Lord to dwell in. He's just he's riffing off of First uh, Peter two five in that. So I mean they they saw themselves on a mission. They they believed themselves like Israel in the Old Testament. We're getting out of Egypt, right? And we're going to this new land, this promised land that God has for us in America. And notice how it, it's almost like he's quoting Hebrews 11.16. To go back to Hebrews 11 again, he says, So they left that goodly and pleasant city, this is in Holland, which had been their resting place for near 12 years. But they knew they were pilgrims and looked not much on those things, but lifted up their eyes to the heavens, their dearest country, and that quieted their spirits. So they left, uh, left that land and uh, went to, of course, England and then on to America. This is the group on the Speedwell that didn't speed too well. It was a ship that carried wine, typically, um, and it leaked. The Speedwell didn't speed very well at all. But here you've got Pastor John Robinson with his hands out like that, his, his eyes lifted to the heavens, and he's praying with them before their journey. And the guy with the Bible, that's our William Brewster, the guy that adopted Bradford, right? Uh, holding uh, the Bible open to the New Testament. He's the mission church pastor. So there they are praying, committing their journey to God. And you'll remember that for 65 days, they were in the tween decks of that ship, five and a half feet. Okay, I'm just, I'm 5'8 now. I used to be 5'9 when I was in high school. So even I, as, as short as I am, would have to get down. That's not to say um, what you'd have to do. You'd be a hurting. <laughs> wouldn't you? I mean, it, you know, you, you tall guys, you know, you, you'd be hurting, wouldn't you? I mean, it would be tough on you to, to be in the middle of that stuff. And you, can you imagine doing everything with a hundred other people? And a lot of people throwing up, you know, in fact, the... The strangers on board, half of them, 55, were from the church, but the other group were not, they were Church of England, okay? They didn't understand these pilgrim people, uh, and they called them puke stockings because they were just literally barfing in their stockings as they were going across. But they were also singing psalms to, to get from the place of fear to faith because they believed God was with them on this journey. They believed God was in this thing. Well, interestingly enough, old John Robinson had written them a letter, the pastor, to open when they got here. And you remember they got here, and they weren't where they were supposed to be. They were supposed to be in Virginia. They were supposed to settle just a little bit north of Jamestown. Well, they're way off. <laughs> they're up in Cape Cod, right? I mean, that's a long way away. And so Robinson said, look, you're going to have conflict with those strangers on board. You guys are going to have to get things together. And here's what he wrote in his letter. This is fascinating to me because the Mayflower Compact almost quotes it. He said, Lastly, whereas you're to become a body politic, using among yourself civil government, let your wisdom and godliness appear not only in choosing such persons, Exodus 18.21, right? We're supposed to select out from among us people who fear God, right? Hate dishonest gain. As do entirely love and will promote the common good. That's straight out of Romans 13. But also yielding unto them all due honor and obedience in their lawful ministrations. That's 1 Peter 2, 13 to 17. Not beholding in them the ordinariness of their persons, but God's ordinance for your good. Back to Romans 13 again. Well, they realize, okay, we're outside where we were supposed to be. So we need a self-governing document. Some say this is the first constitution in America. Some people even call it the birth certificate of America, the Mayflower Compact. They said they came in the name of God, for the glory of God, and for the advancement of the Christian faith. And here's the next lines. A voyage to plant ye first colony in the northern parts of Virginia, in ye presence of God one another, to covenant and combine ourselves together into what? There's that body politic that the pastor talked about, right? to enact just and equal laws, ordinances, acts, constitutions, and officers pick people to serve as representatives because that's the kind of government their church had, elected church leaders. They had elections. You know, when we call a pastor, uh, we have a pastor search committee, right? But we end up voting on the guy. And in the business meeting, there are votes, right, on officers, people who are running committees, people who are serving committees. That, all, that stuff's about to happen or has already happened, I guess, and now we're coming up on budget. 
right, that we're going to vote on. <laughs> the next thing uh, will be budget. But that's what they did in their church. They had elections. And so they brought that principle to America with them. And from time to time be thought meet and convenient for the general good of the colony, Romans 13, under which we promise all what? Due submission and obedience. Here again, they're just quoting the pastor. The pastor was guiding them from the Word of God on how they should do government here. So the principles of American government where you've got civil leaders that are elected and representative comes from where? Yeah, the pilgrims, but by way of the Word of God. Exactly. It comes straight out of the Word. Exactly. So, fascinating. Anyway, well, here's what they said when they got off the ship. Being thus arrived in good harbor and brought safe to land, they fell upon their knees and blessed the God of heaven who had brought them over the vast and furious ocean and delivered them from all the per uh, perils and miseries thereof, again to set their feet on the firm and stable earth. I bet they did. <laughs> After puking in their stockings that whole time, oh my goodness, I can't even imagine trying to go to the bathroom and anything else in the tween decks of that five and a half foot tall uh, space. Anyway, they blessed God. They thanked God when they got here. Now, I'm going to skip because y'all know what happened, right? Over the winter, 102 arrived, uh, 47 remained after winter they had nearly all died there were only three households that did not lose somebody that winter over half of them died uh, during that winter and so now here we are in March and they're really getting down to the end of their food they had found some food believe it or not there were some corn caches in that Patuxent Indian village that they found and they got and they tried to find somebody to pay back and they couldn't find anybody except the Nauset Indians that were shooting arrows at them. <laughs> so they didn't have anybody they could pay. But they tried and finally it happens. There is the first cordial meeting between Native American and the English settlers here. 16th of March and here they come. They're interrupted uh, by savages, and there's one lone man who comes into their uh, camp, and he comes very boldly, all alone, along the houses, straight to the rendezvous, which is the meeting house where they had both church and cannon sticking out the top. <laughs> their church was armed, okay? They were ready for battle. Uh, in their meeting house. But if you ever go there, you'll see that. But here he comes. He comes all the way in. It's kind of like sometimes we'll have a church service and some crazy person will walk down the aisle and then the security finally gets him, you know, <laughs> when he gets down to the bottom, gets down to the front. Uh, but that's what happened to this guy. He came right straight in. They're like, wait, what? what? <laughs> and he came in. He saluted us in English, bade us welcome. He'd learned some broken English among the Englishmen that came to fish. And he knew by name most of the captains and commanders and the masters that usually come. Dermer, Weymouth, John Smith, even Hunt. They, they, he knew all the names. Um, and he could talk with a seemly carriage. In other words, he put his words together, okay. And they began to ask him questions. Um, and noticed that he was stark naked, didn't have have a little leather thong around him there. A tall, straight man, hair of his head black, long behind, only short in the front, and none on his face at all. So, Samoset's this guy. That's who it is. We know that from Mort's relation. Edward Winslow, future governor, tells us. Um, and he told them that the place where they were living was the place where Squanto's people had lived and had died, according to a plague there. And there's nobody... Uh, remaining from that uh, so nobody's here to to you know claim this land so we're going to claim it and um, the next day um, he went back to Massasoit's the guy that's in charge of the Wampanoags and um, he told him how many there were in that tribe 
and uh, Braves, that is. And then the Nossets <laughs> to check out they're much incensed and provoked against the English. Why? Hmm. <laughs> they were the ones that were getting their Braves and taking them away, right? So that's why they're shooting arrows at the Pilgrims when they came. But then a few days later, here he comes. The man of the hour to Squantum. Squanto. Uh, he arrives with a neighboring uh, chief and about four or five days after came the chief with his friends and other attendants and with Squanto and with him after friendly entertainment and some gifts they made peace that has now continued for 24 years. That peace actually established lasted 50 years till King Philip's War. 50 years they pledged a mutual defense treaty. In other words, they said, Massasoit, if anybody attacks you in the Wampanoags, we're there for you. Our arms are at the ready. We'll defend you in battle. But if, uh, but if one of these warlike tribes attacks us, we expect you to come with your braves and defend us. There were like five principles that they agreed on, smoked a peace pipe, and made the agreement. And it lasted 50 years. So all the fake news you hear about, you know, how the pilgrims ran over them and, you know, did them wrong, did them dirty. They tried to find somebody to pay for the corn. They tried to find somebody to pay for the land. And when they did meet the Indians, they made a peace treaty with them. So that they said, look, they attack you, they're attacking us. So, Squanto stayed with them. And here's what Bradford says about him. He was a special instrument sent of God for their good beyond their expectation. And here's what he helped them learn. He showed them how to plant corn, where to take fish and other commodities and guided them to unknown places and never left till he died. And the settlers, as many as were able, began to plant their corn in service, uh, in which service Squanto stood them in good stead, showing them how to plant it and cultivate it. He also told them, unless you get a fish to manure it, it ain't gonna work. <laughs> And he showed them that in the middle of April, plenty of fish had come up the brook by which they'd begun to build. Taught them how to catch those fish and where to get uh, other necessary provisions, uh, all of which they found true by experience, nor was there any man among them who had ever seen a beaver skin till they came out and were instructed by Squanto. He taught them how to do everything. They would not have survived, <laughs> humanly speaking, without this guy helping them out because they didn't know how to fish they didn't know how to farm they didn't do much of anything really um, being the education egg eggheads they were when they were over you know William Brewster writing books their preacher teaching you know teaching Greek in, uh, in Leiden same with John Robinson I mean they were educated people they didn't know how to do all this stuff in a new world so they had to have help and they got that help from Squanto and we all know the story of how things came together that first Thanksgiving, right? Winslow puts it this way. He's the future governor. Our harvest being gotten in, our governor sent four men on fowling, turkey hunting, so that we might, after a special manner, rejoice together after we gathered the fruit of our labors. And God be praised. We had a good increase of corn, and by the goodness of God, we're far from want. And so we know, based on their celebrations in Holland, Thanksgiving festival that they set up with the Native Americans happened, it started on October the 3rd, 1621. Now that's something that uh, learned from a Dutch scholar who studied the pilgrims' habits while living there for 12 years. They celebrated the victory of William of Orange, 1574 I believe, over the Iron Duke Alba of Spain, who was constantly raiding the Dutch and, you know, killing people. And William of Orange from England stopped him and won a great victory over him. And that happened October 3rd. Okay, October 3rd was when they're celebrating Thanksgiving. They had a Thanksgiving every year while they were in Holland on October the 3rd. And that also coincided with something else. The pilgrims were there teaching at Leiden. There were also rabbis teaching Hebrew and Jewish 
culture, religion. What else happens in October, September, October, on the Jewish festival calendar? Sukkot, tabernacles. Exactly. And that was a celebration of the harvest being gotten in. And what did they do? They set up booths, as they called them, you know, these shelters out there in the wilderness, right? And basically commemorating their time out in the wilderness when God miraculously provided them with manna from heaven and water from a rock, right? So they celebrated God's miraculous provision out in the wilderness at the Feast of Tabernacles. Well, here in the New World, guess what these people of God were? They were in the wilderness again, right? <laughs> they're out there in the wilderness, and they're celebrating the miraculous provision of God again by bringing them squanto, who in, in the providence of God survived all these kidnappings and instead of wanting to kill these pilgrims like the Nauset Indians, he came because he was a Christian and out of the goodness of his heart wanted to help them. Instead of taking revenge on them like the Nossets did, he wanted to show them grace and mercy and love because he had something in his heart that was different than the Nosset Indians. And so they celebrated. I mean, it was a big deal. I mean, you had Massasoit and all of, you know, most of his braves and, you know, the, the wives and, you know, little papooses and everything else. You know, everybody bringing the whole family. Miles Standish is shooting off his musket. They're having wrestling matches and foot races and, and they're having a big old feast. And yes, they ate eel. I don't even know why. But, but the pilgrims loved eel and Squanto knew that from back in the old country. Okay, He knew it from back in the old country and he showed them how to catch them here. And so they had eel. But they also had turkey. Okay, so it's all good, right? Turkey, they, they, had, they had venison, they had deer meat, right? Which you're good with that. Um, they had cranberries, okay? Uh, they had a lot of interesting things, interesting vegetables that we don't have. Of course, corn, a lot of corn, uh, right? <laughs> and so they had this big feast. And of course, we don't have the record of it, but we know that the mission church pastor would have prayed over the meal, right? Every time, at Thanksgiving to God. In fact, they had a two-hour church service every Sunday. So I guarantee you they prayed over this meal, right? Two hours uh, every Sunday morning. And then they had an afternoon meeting on Sunday afternoon when they let uh, uh, lay members prophesy. And the elders would critique or affirm what was being said in the afternoon session. Uh, but they were serious about praying, so I guarantee they prayed. Uh, but here's how it all came down for the sad end of Squanto. And I, I, I got to be honest with you. I mean, I could have showed you in about four slides, um, and I just decided not to put them in here. But, it, but he wasn't a perfect man. Nobody who's ever walked this earth except Jesus was perfect, okay? He's sinless. We all know that. And Squanto um, got the big head. And he ended up trying to pit the natives against the English and some other natives against other natives, trying to gain advantage uh, to show himself as irreplaceable and very important and worthy of, you know, acclamation and pay. So the pilgrims, because he had literally saved them, decided that, that they would not do anything to him, but Massasoit wanted to kill him. Massasoit, because the pilgrims and Massasoit got together and said, he's lying. And they wanted, he wanted, Massasoit wanted to execute him, but the pilgrims said, no, he's, he's too useful to us. God's, God's blessed us with him, and so we're not going to let you have him. So there was a disagreement, and he caused it. So just to let you know, he wasn't a perfect guy. But here's how he came to his end. He was on a trading expedition. He was with Miles Standish. Everything was going swimmingly until 
He fell ill of Indian fever, bleeding much of the nose, which the Indians take as a symptom of death. And within a few days he died. And he begged the governor, look at this, to pray for him, that he might go to the Englishman's God in heaven. Apparently he didn't have that P of tulip down. He didn't have the assurance of his salvation. I don't know. Uh, and he bequeathed several of his things to some of his English friends, his remembrances, and his death was a great loss. No doubt. I mean, this guy helped them navigate the difficult world of all these various tribes, who's warlike, who's not, who's friendly, uh, to trade with them, uh, also to help them live on the land. I mean, that was the biggest deal, right? So it was a great loss when Squanto died. And again, Bradford described him as a special instrument sent of God for their good beyond their expectation. I think of him almost like an American Joseph. Remember Joseph was thrown in jail, thrown in prison, right? Thrown in a hole in the ground first, left for dead, then they finally said, oh no, we'll get some money off of him, sold him, you know, to the Egyptians, Potiphar, and he ends up because of no fault of his own, getting thrown into a different jail, right? <laughs> and languishing there, forgotten there by everybody except one, God. And God took him out of that prison and put him in the palace into a position of authority and power through his providence, working through it all. Same thing true of, of Squanto, maybe in a whole lot lesser degree, but you see it. You see the providence of God and the way God worked through this man to help save this colony. And this colony is a foundation stone for this country. So, just a couple of points on providence because, I mean, everybody here is going through stuff, right? I mean, we all have the stuff that we go through. Maybe we've not been thrown... Uh, and, you know, clapped in irons and thrown in the hold of a ship and then taken away from our family and then come back to find our family wiped out. Um, but here's a word for you if you're suffering something. And that is that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing to the glory that's going to be revealed in us. God's got a purpose in, in what you're going through, okay? And, and that is we know that He's working these things, right? He's working all these things. Whatever is happening in your life, just like with Squanto, all the suffering that that guy went through, all the captivities and, and all the privation and, and all the sorrow that he experienced, um, God worked that for a good purpose. He used him as a special instrument to save the people of God. And he's working things in your life. May not, may not be pleasant right now, may not be be fun to experience, but I guarantee you they're for your good and for His glory. He's working things in your life. And here's the deal. It doesn't matter what is going on in your life. Nothing can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Nothing. And in all these things, if we look at it from the right perspective, we're more than conquerors. Because one day we're going to rule and reign with Him. Right? The, amen. Amen. That's the providence of God. God's providence is active and at work in your life. If you've got eyes to see, and man, I, I could take you through my life and go point by point by point and show you that every move, every decision, everything in my life, I will look back and I see God's handprints all over it. And it's amazing to me to look back and see that. But with eyes of faith, that's what we need to do. We need to look and see the hand of God at work in your life, even through the tough stuff you're dealing with. He's working his, his, your good in His glory. He is. And through it all, He loves you. And nothing can separate you from His love. Praise God for that. Amen? I think that's something that Squanto teaches us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you uh, for your providence that we see on display. It's amazing to, to look back and behold all that you did in the beginnings of America. Uh, to take a man like this Native American that none of us would have even had a second thought about, probably, 
guy standing there in a leather loincloth, couldn't speak English. What could you do with that? Well, you did a lot. <laughs> and, and God, sometimes we think, oh, you know, who am I? I'm nobody. How could you ever use me? And yet, that's exactly the kind of person you like to use. <laughs> Not the high and mighty. <laughs> It's, it's the folks that don't have a name, don't have a position, don't have um, a lot of stuff. Most of the time, those are the people that you like to use the most. And so, God, we just pray that instead of fighting against your plans and your providence, Lord, that we would submit to it, yield ourselves to it, surrender, Lord to your purposes and your ways, that you're trying to work in us for your good and, and uh, for our good and your glory. And so, God, I just pray that, that you would help us to, to see with eyes of faith what you're doing. It's hard to do until after it's over with, but God, help us to see in the moment and the now what you're working in us and know that, it, that whatever we're suffering in the midst of it, and trouble that we're going through, it's not worthy to be compared to the glory that you're going to reveal in us. And Lord, help us to know that through it all, that nothing can separate us, not death or life or angels or anything can separate us from your love in Christ Jesus. And we're grateful for that today. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Have a great week this week.